Uh, all right. Welcome to the Biohacking Beauty Podcast, where we explore the cutting edge of skin health innovation. I'm your host, Amitai Eshel, co-founder and CEO of Young Goose, the world's first biohacking skincare brand, bringing you in-depth conversations with industry leaders and innovators who are redefining beauty with breakthrough products and methods. Today, we are incredibly excited to host an extraordinary guest, Dr. Sandra Kaufman, a distinguished academic. Dr. Kaufman is the chief of pediatric anesthesia at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital and the author of two groundbreaking books uh, named The Kaufman Protocols. Uh, one is Why We Age and How to Stop It, and the other one is called uh, Aging Solutions. She's recognized globally for her deep understanding of cellular degeneration and aging and has brilliantly has conveyed her knowledge of cellular biology, clinical medicine, and theories of aging into the development of the Kaufman Protocol, which I absolutely love. Her work offers the potential to revolutionize how we think about aging and skincare, bringing a molecular approach that can offer insights into slowing the aging process from the cellular level up. With over 20 years of experience in the medical field, she brings a wealth of knowledge on cellular biology and anti-aging strategies, making her an invaluable voice in the longevity industry. The key takeaways from our conversation today will be Dr. Kaufman's insights, the cellular causes of aging and skin aging specifically, her work in developing the Kaufman protocol, and how her findings can be applied to achieving healthier and more vibrant skin. Before we dive into our conversation today, I first want to share a review from one of our valued biohacking beauty listeners. All right, so someone writes, uh, biohacking beauty is a goldmine of skincare knowledge. Each episode is packed with science-based insights that are easy to understand and apply. This podcast has quickly become my number one source for all things health. So thank you very much for that. And if you haven't done so already, we would greatly appreciate it if you could take two seconds out of your day to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Even a one-word review would be amazing uh, because your rating and reviews greatly help with the growth of this podcast, which helps us educate more people. So without further ado, let's delve into our enlightening conversation with Dr. Sandra Kaufman. All right, Sandy, welcome to the Biohacking Beauty podcast. I mean, you are the face of what biohacking beauty is, so I'm really excited to to have you on. You are so kind to say that. I appreciate that. I think you're actually the face of biohacking beauty. (laughs) I'm just an old hag trying to figure this stuff out. (laughs) No, I mean, frankly, uh, you are someone that I've been wanting to have for a very, very long time. You are super busy and inspirational, so it took a while. But uh, first of all, I think a story like, Before we met, I remember us presenting at the first event we ever presented in after COVID. It was the Miami Biohacking Congress. And someone told me, you know, you're dealing with a lot of interesting molecules. You should read read the Kaufman Protocol. Like uh, that was that was my first uh, impression, like the first time I heard about you. And then they're like, well, she is in South Florida. So I, I kind of already knew who you are when we met the first time, um, but maybe, yeah, maybe we, we should start by you telling me, us, a little bit about how you started being interested in everything that's, we can call it biohacking, we can call it longevity. Where is your interest coming from? Because you're so diverse. Uh, excellent question. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of a silly story. Uh, I started out uh, as a cell biologist. I was a tropical ecologist at one point in my training. Um, I diverted my attention to med school when my dad pointed out that plants and cells don't pay bills. So I became an <laughs> anesthesiologist, um, and that sort of taught me the you know how drugs affect the body and how the body affects drugs and dosages and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but probably more importantly than that, I am like the biggest amateur athlete. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all know very professional athletes, so in no way can I compare myself to them. <clears throat> uh, <it's, laughs> 
Uh, but anyway, I was hanging off a cliff like in my mid 40s. And, you know, I'm a big rock climber. I love rock climbing. And uh, it dawned on me. I was in, like a hanging belay. Literally, you're hanging like off a cliff. The rope is like, you know, chucked into the rock and uh -huh. a little spooky. And I thought, if I get any older, I'm not going to be able to pull this off anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So I just decided to go down this crazy road of trying to figure out what longevity really was. And I didn't know anyone sort of in the field. I didn't even know the space existed, to be honest with you. And I just went straight to the literature. Um, and as a wow. cell biologist, I thought, OK, I'm going to figure this out. Right. That's kind of a crazy thing to say. But I'm like, I'm going to do this. So I spent a ton of time just reading article after article after article. Why do cells age? You know, breaking it down into categories and subcategories and then trying to figure out how to combat it. So this was my own personal desire not to get old, to keep doing really dumb stuff like hanging off of cliffs. That's interesting. It's so similar to where we come from, where I came from, where where it's basically get, getting out of the military, you know, getting, getting a, and wanting to, to be my delusional aging athlete, trying to keep up with the young guys and, and doing everything to keep my body functioning, even though I'm redlining it every day. And so that's very, very similar. But you are really a canary in the coal mine as far as uh, longevity goes. So how much do you do now, would you say, on a regular basis? Because you, again, like you are doing a lot, right? Uh, in terms of longevity? Oh, yeah, yeah I do a crazy. Well, you know, it's funny. In the real world of longevity, I guess I'm considered a reasonably, I'm a moderate. Mm -hmm. um, compared to the rest of the world, one might say I'm a little bit nuts. I recently met Dave Asprey uh, at a conference and we were having this fantastic conversation. And, you know, I think he's like way over the top and a little bit of a lunatic. And he looked at me and he's like, yeah, you take far too many drugs, uh -huh. um, which, which indicated that we're all a little bit nuts, but we all come at it from different, uh, you know, different ways of looking at things. So I deeply believe in using uh, molecules to affect all of your aging pathways. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trained in the art of using medications in my world. Anything that gets into your body that's a molecule that changes you can be used for good. So mm -hmm. I don't really care if something is a pharmaceutical agent or if it's natural or if it was invented in a laboratory like two days ago. If some molecule is efficacious and it helps us not to age, I am all for it. And as a consequence of that, I probably take 60 to 70 things a day. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it looks nuts. Some people take more than that. But I try to make good decisions based on the science. We all do. And I do a variety of other things. I don't do things that are miserable. Like yeah. I refuse to jump into cold ice baths. I just think that that's just looks agonal. <laughs> like it's crazy. I just won't do it. You know, I am more than happy to sit in front of a, you know, a red infrared light thing forever. You know, I, I have a few of those sitting around and I adore them because they're comfortable and you can sort of like you know, meditate yeah. while you're, you're doing your therapy, but freezing your butt off sounds absolutely miserable. And that's where I draw the line. No, I get it. Um, and I mean, it's funny because I just saw, um, MitoPure having a, an ingenious commercial calling their, obviously their, their supplement, uh, ice bath in a pill. And even <laughs> though I would completely disagree with that, uh, with that statement, I think it's a really cool way to explain science like in one sentence where like oh you don't want to do this miserable thing there is there is a composition of chemicals that would mimic that and i think that's a lot of your approach right like how, what do i want to achieve in my body and what are the molecules that are going to take it there that that is exactly correct because it is far easier in my world to unravel a biochemical pathway mm -hmm. right like you know you don't want to get to x like there's seven steps to get to X, whatever it is. And so if you can sort of decelerate each one of those enzymatic steps or, or block them, then, then you win. And it's mm -hmm. so much easier. I mean, maybe figuring out the science behind it isn't exactly as easy as it sounds. But, you know, once you've got it down, taking a few pills is so much easier. And you're right. Uh, MitoQ is not an ice bath in a bottle. They are significantly mm -hmm. different as far as I'm concerned. But yeah. good advertising strategy. Incredible. I love that. So, um, and of course, you, you wrote a book, which is called The Kaufman Protocol. So I think one of the things that are interesting to me, did you write a book in order to force yourself to dive deep into each and every, you know, pathway and strategy? Or did you write a book out of your already kind of substantiated um, kind of experience after you've gone through some trials and, and saw results? 
No. So I had no intention of ever writing a book. Actually, mm. that's not true. I started writing historical fiction in my 20s, and I have some books that didn't do very well whatsoever, but you know, historically, they're kind of interesting. Uh -huh. <laughs> but no, I started this longevity thing and, um, you know, I was just sitting there in, in my office trying to figure out why we age. Mm -hmm. And I had a thousand post-it notes sitting around, you know, and like I sort of started organizing it. And these articles would say, you know, like in order to activate sort two and one pathway, like resveratrol, the gold standard, comma, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, that sounds kind of cool. Anyway, so I developed all of this. And after doing this in my office, you know, six months, a year, year and a half, two years, I got to tell you, like, well, number one, the OR is filled with very interesting people, very dynamic from various, you know, different aspects of, you know, of life, different mm -hmm. economic uh, backgrounds, educational backgrounds. But I got to tell you, not one person in that OR did not walk by my office and said, oh, my God, what are you doing to yourself? Because it's working. Explain it to me. So I had to sort of like dilute the information down into tellable stories or tellable, understandable chunks. Mm -hmm. um, and after doing it like a million times, I thought, I guess I should kind of write this down. And it just flowed because I'd already said it like a million times. And so I really had no intention of writing the book. It just sort of came out. Um, the yeah. funny thing is, once you write a book, it's really hard, at least in my world, to get it published because I, I presented it to a few publishers and they're like, well, do you have a degree in, in longevity? And I said, well, there is no degree in longevity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They're like, well, you need to be an expert. I'm like, well, you're not an expert until you write a book. I wrote the book, but I'm not really an expert. Um, the irony is that now I am an expert and now I've got two books behind me. So, you know, it's, it's the whole chicken and egg phenomenon. But I didn't write the book for any goal other than to share with other people the information that people kept asking me. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's interesting because I think you are in our community. There are a lot of longevity experts that there is a dissonance and I'm not actually bashing anyone. They, they, they do have a lot of valuable information, but there is a dissonance between the, the information that they have and they talk about and the way they look and the way they, they function, you know, they, <laughs> they, they, they don't look great. Um, and I think you are like the best example of someone who also, also knows the part, but also looks the part. So it was a big part of, what you were aiming at was to look younger or is it just a legit byproduct and you've never you've never you know it was never a part of the strategy well you you know that i'm a woman right i mean <laughs> yeah so all, all all women don't want to look old um mm -hmm. so I, I would say that half of the way that i act and feel and look is because of the protocol mm -hmm. and the other half is because i'm very active and, and then the rest is what I call speckle. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Because, you know, and everyone's like, really speckle? And the answer is, of course. Like, if you take a wall that's breaking down, there's, you know, like, we take the goo, we cover it up, we paint the wall, and no one ever sees the crap underneath. Um, I think I have done that to my face a million times, right? The Botox, yeah. the PRP, I inject exosomes into my face. Um, yeah. It's it's complete vanity on, on top of the fact that you just wonder, like, well, what can I do? I mean, I've... You know, I've never been a raging beauty, but certainly it's kind of fun to think that I'm going to win in the long run. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you are, I actually have seen pictures of you from long, from, from, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you've always been beautiful, but it's, it's crazy that, that you really, you know, you kind of look the same as time goes on, which, which is, is pretty crazy. But, you know, I think there is a little bit of a different differentiation between um, something like fillers and Botox and something like PRP and um exosomes because one is really you know let's say spackle and, and the other is is therapeutic spackle for for lack from lack of a better word um, okay, 100 well so i you can't throw botox and filler into the same category i don't yeah. think yeah. so as far as i'm concerned like so as an anesthesiologist i paralyze people every day right this is just what mm -hmm. we do we relax their muscles so we can operate on them all botox is is localized paralytic agents Mm -hmm. Right. And if you don't move your muscles around, then you don't get the creases. So it's fat, you know, and it's, and it's reasonably short acting yeah. you know, three month ish basis. Um, filler, I'm not a huge fan of because it does seem just like you're putting stuffing under your skin to hold. But you're absolutely right. The rest of it, which is why I love PRP and exosomes, is that you're actually reconditioning your skin and regenerating the tissue that you have lost. Uh, and, yeah. and I do this now to just a plethora of people. 
um, with these crazy groups of women and we call it a Botox PRP club. And you know, <laughs> once they've got the, had the PRP once or twice, they sign up for life. For um, sure. Their wrinkles are better. Their skin is vibrant. They're just the happiest people in the world. Um, yeah. it's, just, it's truly amazing what it does. It is. And we are living in, it's, you know, it's, it's the, uh, the kind of Botox has worst nightmare has, or actually like, let's say hyaluronic acid fillers, marketing agents, worst nightmare has come to life because, you know, for the longest time, uh, what we let's call it just like straight up cosmetic injections, uh, claimed is that it also like promotes collagen for, for a little bit or something like that. And really it was more of a marketing ploy to make the person that's getting injected feel it, feel better. But now we do have those injections that really you can inject your face. It's some, some cases you're, you're also filling it up a little bit, but on, in the background, there is an incredible uh, rejuvenation happening. And, and as you mentioned, you, it's really something that is so visible and, and not only in, you know, less wrinkles, but, but as far as skin health, like how the skin behaves, what happens to it after you, you got exposed to the sun, there is, there is so much there that is not only, that cannot be described only by a specific, you know, mm -hmm. marker. Oh yeah. And, and the other thing that I've recently been experimenting with is, um, uh, salmon DNA particles. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, yeah. the, the salmon, uh, what is it? It's called the, the mesotherapies, uh -huh. um, which is non-invasive. It's pretty interesting. It's like, uh, well, so what's interesting is when you read the box, of course, like, of course I read South Korean. No, I don't, <laughs> um, you know, it says topical, but you can actually put it sub Q, uh -huh. um, and it, it gets broken down to, into purines and pyrimidines. Mm -hmm. Um, and it actually increases the DNA turnover. Uh, of, of, of your fibroblasts in your skin. And so it really, it's another component to sort of helping your skin health over time. Um, and is, is it something I, that, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, I think that skin aging and taking care of your skin, it's just, it's multifactorial. There's just so many layers. Yeah. Obviously there's the topicals, then there's the injectables, there's the reconstructed. There, there's so many things that you can do. It's just an amazing process. A hundred percent. And, and, you know, we do speak about uh, the unfortunate uh, role that the skin plays or, or the unfortunate lack of a dominant role that, that skin rejuvenation uh, plays as we grow older, especially when we pass our kind of prime reproductive age where the skin has is really genetically is an abandoned as an, as a, as an organ that is communicating sexual health and vibrancy and is becoming more more and more is just a protective layer to the rest of our body. And, and we really have to, if, if we want to look a certain way, we have to take it to our own hands, you know, or to a professional sense. But uh, so talking about like this salmon, uh, salmon proteins, is it something that um, people can get done professionally now? Or is it something that we are still waiting on? That's an excellent question. And I don't really know the answer to that because mm -hmm. I do this goofy thing and I order all of my injectables from South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they're on there and I've ordered them and I inject them into myself. Gotcha. What I don't know is if you're not a healthcare professional, if you can get that in the United States at the moment. And I know your listeners and be like, well, why are you talking about it if we can't get it? And the answer is, <laughs> Uh, it's Googleable, uh, and it and it is the future, and we we are getting there. Um, yeah. So what else? So you mentioned uh, PRP, and um, which obviously some people will remember as its branded name, uh, Vampire Facial, or uh, exosomes, which are the communication cell, the communication part of of uh, stem cells, for that matter. But what else um, were you doing? on purpose in order to get better uh, skin results, either, you know, inside or outside? So that's a good question. Um, and, and you're going to know all of this, but I'll sort of reiterate it for the, for the sake of your listeners. Um, skin, of course, gets attacked from the inside and from the outside, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate, which is why it kind of looks crummy over time. But you can also fix it from the outside and from the inside. Yeah. Um, and if anyone's curious about, you know, what I do, I think there's seven tenets of aging and talks about, you know, you kind of talk about all of the cellular reasons why you age and your fibroblasts in your skin are really not necessarily so different from the rest of your cells in your body. So as mm -hmm. long as you're on any systemic, um, 
uh, longevity program, your fibroblasts are going to benefit just like your kidney cells or your brain cells or your liver cells. Yeah. Um, right. So that, that's going to get to a certain degree to your dermis. Um, in terms of getting to your epidermis, that's mostly topical, but not necessarily. And it has to do with the vacillation of your dermal epidermal junction. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but so that obviously, you know, the dermis has your fibroblasts with the collagen and the hyaluronic acid and the lymphatics and all that. Then there's a, a layer of um, vacillating tissue, the junction, and then the epidermis is, of course, on top. You know, blood mm-hmm. vessels go to the epidermis. So it's really tough to get stuff from one to the other and vice versa. When you are young, that vacillatory layer is extremely wavy. So if you looked at it in cross section or in 3D, it'd look like an egg crate. Yeah. Unfortunately, as you get older, it flattens out. So the, the, the surface area between the two layers um, just becomes minimalized. And so you really then have to aggressively put stuff on the top and from underneath. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, I probably fall into the category of kind of getting old. So I, I aggressively do both the top and the bottom. Um, but specifically for the skin, I think my favorite two things have to be astaxanthin and uh-huh. polypodium. And, and the reason I say that is astaxanthin, it's, it's just such an amazing molecule, right? It comes from uh, angry algae. Algae gets pissed off. It secretes this orangey, pinky crap. Uh Um, The molecule is just an amazing molecule. It goes to your mitochondria. It sucks up free radicals. And when you're in the sun, basically you don't burn as much. Um, And I know this to be true because I am pale and I live on Miami Beach. And both of my daughters are uber pale. um, And they're outside all the time. And they know when they've taken their astaxanthin and they know when they haven't because they just come back as fried little fish. But so theoretically, astaxanthin prevents DNA damage and inflammatory issues. And if you get any... Uh, damage, then the polypodium actually increases DNA repair rates in the skin and gets rid of the CPDs, um, mm-hmm. which is actually when your DNA gets melted together. So repairing exactly. that reduces the risk of, of skin cancer. So between protecting it and then fixing it from the inside, I think that's kind of crucial. So are these molecules, because they can also be applied topically, but are you talking about taking them, ingesting them? Oh yeah. So this is systemic. Okay. Because there are people who would, you know, take capsules and break them and, and apply them also on the skin. But, but no, um, 100%. The, the only problem with that is that astaxanthin is extremely orange. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, like it yeah. is bitterly orange. Um, yeah. I do make this crazy body butter um, that I slather oh, wow. on myself in the shower every morning. And it's, it's a combination of different butters. And I put a ton of astaxanthin in it. Uh huh. Um, Very nice. But I do know when I overdo it, I really like my legs are orange. So, yes it's probably like better ingested in large quantities. Definitely. And also, obviously, that is a great, um, a great antioxidant in general, even if you're not in the sun. It's an antioxidant that really finds it, its way to the skin. And, and um, you know, even if we're exposed to artificial light, EMF, pollution, all of those things also increase oxidative stress in the skin. So it, it's, it's a good idea to use it even if we're, it's not a, you know, a sunny day in Miami Beach and, and we're strolling on it on the sand. Uh, okay. So that's something you're ingesting, but these are the, but these aren't the easy things. What about the Sandy Kaufman things? You know, I mean, you are, you are famous for, uh, eating donuts and yes. taking something in order for it to, not to affect you. So what are some of the things that you're doing? Obviously we're talking about things that we're doing to the body and expresses express themselves in the skin. But what are you doing that's special or exciting or exciting you or interesting to you? You know, it's funny. So I go through these phases of things that interest me and I learn all about them and I come with a collection of things I'm going to take to fix them. And Uh then it just sort of becomes old hat, push them aside and then move on to something else. Right. Which is why my pile of things just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, Six months ago, I was well, I love donuts. Everyone knows I, I love donuts. Mm-hmm. Um, donuts clearly are not good for you. The glucose, the cholesterol, the, you know, the lipids, that sort of thing. So I probably am on four or five things that block the cholesterol lipid uh, process. Mm-hmm. And I probably take 10, 15 things that block all the glucose. I decided that glucose affects you or you can, you can, you can change the way it affects you in, in seven different essential ways. Mm -hmm. For example, you can block the way glucose gets absorbed into your GI tract. You can block uh, glyconeogenesis in your liver. You can block Mm -hmm. glucose processing. You can block AGE production. You can, um, 
You can strip AGEs. You can do a variety of really amazingly cool things. So here's my one of my latest things that I just absolutely adore is the molecule lactoferrin. Mm-hmm. Uh, so lactoferrin, obviously, uh, carry it's from milk and it carries iron, i.e. the name. But what's really cool is the molecule looks kind of like a bow tie or a barbell, right? It's two big globs with a little connector piece. And yeah. it turns out each side has this little bonding area and it's supposed to carry iron, right? But there's a motif in there. It's called the ABCD motif. Um, and it loves AGEs. Mm-hmm. So if you take exogenous lactoferrin, it's going to suck up your AGEs out of your vasculature and out of your tissues and excrete them. So I call that my AGE sponge, right? So you try to block the production of AGEs. Um, and then if which you can't... AGEs, AGEs are, are advanced lactation end products, which are, which are really one of the major drivers of skin aging or the appearance of aging in the skin. Correct. So just just for your listeners, so AGE is advanced glycation end products is when a glucose or a reducing sugar, fructose mm-hmm. is actually seven to 10 times worse than glucose and ribose mm-hmm. is, is like a thousand times like worse. It sticks under oxidizing conditions. Of course, as we get older, we're all being oxidized and then you need some sort of a metal catalyst, which we all have as well. Uh, and then it sticks to mostly proteins, but also DNA and lipids. And it destroys like all of your tissues. Mm-hmm. And the example that I, that I like to use, is if you think about a cloth dinner napkin, you've got fibers of collagen sort of sliding around just like in your skin. And an AGE plops itself onto the collagen, it glues itself there. And much like if you put a drop of super glue on a napkin, if you tried to slide the fibers, they break. Yeah. Right. Same thing happens to the skin. You get an AGE or a collection of AGEs in your skin. You try to slide it around collagen breaks uh, and your skin just becomes very fragile and, and old looking. Yeah. So blocking AGEs from sitting your skin and or trying to get rid of them. And it's hard to get rid of them once already sort of like stuck in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you can sort of decelerate the process, um, then it's a win win. So I yeah. take a ton of lactoferrin just because it's kind of fun. Interesting. We actually designed our eye care to try and mitigate some of the effects of AGEs and clear AGEs from the skin, obviously around the eyes, uh, because it is notoriously fine and um, you know easy to be damaged to begin with because you move that area so much. So that was one of the things when we look at a product and we say, hey, we need to biohack this product. We're trying to mitigate some of the, the effect of AGEs as well. So it's, it's very interesting that you're saying that. So that is, that is obviously, as far as glucose go, what else would you say are molecules that you ing- that you ingest that uh, find their way to better skin at the end of the day? I'm assuming some peptides, like um, I don't know which peptides you're you're interested in, but uh, you know there are a lot of peptides that are very you know very positive as far as the way we look at the end. So it's it's really kind of funny. Um, I'm not a huge peptide fan. Uh, Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is I'm on so many regular molecules that every time I throw one in Mm -hmm. uh, a peptide, like nothing happens. Yeah. So I I actually come and and it it may sound absolutely crazy, but I think that I'm like physiologically optimized. I've been unable to make like my mitochondria any better. I've been unable to make anything any better, but I use so many crazy things. Yeah. Um, So we are talking about the eyes, for example, in your lenses, of course, they, they undergo a ton of oxidative stress, uh, as well as a ton of glycation. So I use two goofy eye drops. And as a consequence, my vision is perfect. Wow. Um, so it's, it's just a matter of sort of like the combinations of, of all over your body, right? Because the yeah. skin is just like every other cell, you've got to, you know, maximize your sirtuins, which by the way, I have to, I, I loved your products when I first saw them because you did such a good job at sort of like attacking all of the tenants of aging. Yeah. If I recall, there was one with NAD and resveratrol mm-hmm. and, and just a variety of like, it was like a, a few of my favorite things in a bottle. And it was so exciting to me. Yeah. I mean, that's why we, we connect because that's what ex, what's exciting to us as well. Most of the time when you see skincare, the idea, and it's a good idea, actually, uh, if you think of skincare as a whole, that maybe was the first biohack ever, right? Imagine someone in a cave taking some of the fat of the animal that they were eating, lathering, up their, lathering it on their face, and they're like, wow, that feels pretty nice. But the problem is, is that skin care really 
halted as far as regulation by saying, oh, we, we improve the appearance of aging, right? We are trying to trick the observer in having the skin appear younger. But the problem is, and, and that's kind of what we talked about uh, here, is that the skin still ages in the background. You are still, you know, getting those AGEs attached to your skin cells and to the, the to the cells that create collagen, for example. You are still getting that oxidative stress. You're still the hallmarks of aging. Whether you want to say that there are seven, or you know, now they they jumped up to like twelve, whatever that is, they are still being destroyed and and mangled in the background. So what we try to do is. We try to create, I think, the most honest skincare because we said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to try and address the core issues that drive skin aging. Does it give you the best results off the bat? Maybe if you if, if it can fix a problem fast, and that's kind of random, to be honest, but the results a year out, two years out, three years out are, you know, that's kind of what we want to see that someone has the, the effect that you have without, you know, your education and your you know, commitment to taking those 60, 70 things a day, really by fixing at least the skin, if that's what they're interested in. Because to be honest with you, our skincare is is not going to be the most important thing if someone wakes up every day like you and is utterly fascinated by, by longevity. Because you're doing it. It's like you said about peptides, right? You're kind of covering all those bases probably a few times over. But most of the people, they have a normal job. They have a normal, you know, whatever that is, they can't just sit down and read all the longevity books ever, uh, or there aren't any books, actually. There aren't like that many books, but there there are a lot of papers and try to create their own system. Um, so what we did is, is, is create that system, but in the skin specifically. Right. No, I, I think you guys have done an absolutely tremendous job of doing that. I love the mixtures. I think it's really cool. Um, and I think that people need to understand um, that what you put on your skin is the same theoretically as what you need to put in your body. Yeah. Um, and I and I always tell people that they go, oh, I use brand X and I've used it for 30 years or one <laughs> product. And I go, yeah, that's nice. Um, and, I, and, I, and I like to use the example that broccoli is really good for you, mm -hmm. right? But if you ate broccoli all day, every day for 30 years, you're not getting the nutrients that you need because it has some, but it certainly doesn't have all of them. Mm -hmm. So I truly like the idea of mixing up skincare yeah. because there, you, your skin ages for so many different reasons that you want to make sure you hit them all. Yeah. Right? And, and I will tell you that I use your stuff in the morning and then I slather myself with TA65 at night. Yeah. Um, Right. Because that's sort of at the moment, the only uh, telomerase like pseudo activator that we have. Right. So I'll tell you a secret, though. So uh, TA65 is a is a branded version of a, an active that's called astragal, ast astragaloside 4 IV. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, we actually have it in care. Oh, nice. But we actually have another uh, the t telomere supporting product that I like the most actually is our cleanser because oh, we, it has, it, it has a lot of apigenin and the reason we put apigenin there or chamomile essence, which is rich in apigenin is in order to clear something that's called CD38. That if anyone has heard my rants about NAD is kind of the, I call it the Pac-Man of NAD, right? It travels around and just eats NAD. Um, so yeah, but, but TA65 is an, an amazing product. Uh, and most of the time, we are the uh, the expensive brand people opt for. But if someone wants to go crazy, TA65 oh, is a good idea. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's absolutely absurd. And I ended up, the only reason I actually have it is because I bought a gazillion bottles. Uh -huh. of, uh, you know, I was sitting at a booth at a conference and we were negotiating how much I would have to pay and how many I would have to buy. Mm -hmm. um, and I spent far too much money. And now I have cases of stuff that I probably will never get through. But I got a good mm -hmm. price on it, damn it. That's what's important. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, that's that's uh, one of those products that has, you know, they, this company has invested so much money into proving their product works. It's a little bit difficult to then say, you know, yeah, it works great, but um, we're working on something else now or we want to innovate, right? Because they are so invested financially into this 
model. And and I and I feel I mean we are doing it uh, every time we. So right now we're innovating with spermidine. It's extremely difficult <laughs> to uh, bite that bullet to say whatever whatever we did until now is fantastic, but we're going to add another molecule and prove it works. So, but that's that's the obsession. That's what yeah, we do. That's the obsession. We, we get very excited about what we have, and we go, okay, now what? Right. Exactly. I mean, my latest obsession, or my about a year ago, I became obsessed with Centella asiatica. Right. Okay. Um, it is amazing for your skin, just mm-hmm. absolutely amazing. And you can buy it as you know whole. You can buy it in all of its like broken down components. You can eat it. You can slather it on your skin. You can, you know, you you can you can buy it like in a cream form. You can buy it in a liquid form. And I just started like bathing in that stuff. Um, and and how do you buy it? Well, you I mean, it, it sort of depends, right? I buy, I get the actual pills, the capsules, and I take mm-hmm. that orally because it's amazing for you. Um, but then it, there's also a cream that you can get from South Korea because they have really good stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. And then you can actually go to these companies and buy like just the, the liquid uh, extract in bulk mm-hmm. um, and dump it into my goofy homemade stuff because it's fun. Yeah. See, see, I can't compete with you, but I have this goofy stuff called Swamp Juice. I know. I Right. And I, I just I put it in a really pretty container to disguise the fact that it's ugly and kind of green and crappy looking. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so, you know, I put Santella in there and aloe vera and white tea because white tea is an MMP inhibitor, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, in a variety of other goofy things. Um, yeah, that's a good. Co- I mean, that's a good. You know, I wish uh, talking about the MMPs, MMP one, two um, in the conversation of longevity would be more more common a lot of the times i say we didn't find a pill that works better than community right like community is the number one longevity inducer if you would and that is because it there is a, some effect on stress that we cannot really get with anything else that we are doing on our own and um so obviously mmps are a big part of cortisol and, and high cortisol levels is it something that you're also um, engaged in? Because again, you are you are a go getter. You are kind of this person that is um, on, on the bleeding edge. How does let's call it just like relaxation practices, if you would, tie into someone that's so you know like a go getter? So I think people find relaxation in different activities. Mm-hmm. Some people find it in meditating. Some mm-hmm. people, you know, sitting, you know. Sit, sit on the beach and meditate. I actually feel relaxed when I'm exercising. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of like, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a good twofer. So I'm, I'm a big swimmer. Mm-hmm. Um, so I listen to beautiful music as I'm swimming. And I swim in a, in a really nice, wonderful saline pool. So I'm not, you know, drowning in chlorine. Yeah. And you just disappear for 45 minutes and just swim. And it's it's so relaxing and it's amazing. And do you uh, still mountain climb? I do. I have not been up any big mountains lately. I've been training in the gyms for, for more rock climbing. And I'm yeah, going to yeah, go yeah. out in, in October, September or October. We're going to go out, I don't know, probably to, I don't know, some someplace out west. We haven't really quite decided. I've not been out. Th- COVID destroyed my my big mountain climbing expeditions for a little while. Um, and then post COVID running an anesthesia department was a bit challenging and so on and so forth. Um, but th- those, those days are coming back. And what's fun yeah. about how out, high altitude climbing is that I figured out that you can change the cytochrome C system in your mitochondria mm-hmm. so that you can process oxygen differently. So you're not as tired and not as hypoxic on the mountain. Interesting. And, um, uh, so how, how would you do that? Because cytochrome C, uh, the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, structure of the mitochondria is notoriously problematic, especially when we're injured, old, uh, frail, whatever that is. It creates a lot of oxidative stress on its own, leads to cellular death, inflammation. So, how how do you enhance that uh, structure? So, all of the all of the cytochromes um, are based, have a ton of subunits, right? Mm-hmm. So, for example, complex one, and I call them complex, they are complexes, but complex mm-hmm. one literally has like 30 to 40 subunits in it. They're, and it's really interesting because they're, they're components of both DNA, 
from your nucleus and DNA from your mitochondria. So these odd, like bizarro composite molecules. Yeah. So, so cytochrome C is a composite molecule. And by changing the sub pieces in it, you can make your mitochondria function more like um, a Sherpa than like a, a lowlander like myself. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting is so normally a, a lowlander um, processes oxygen. And as you get higher and you, and you become more hypoxic, your, your cytochromes serve to protect you from hypoxia, mm -hmm. right? And it takes time to acclimate. So your saturations tend to be a little higher, but your energy levels sort of bite the dust, yeah. right? By changing that, what I did when I went to Aconcagua right before COVID hit is my sats were lower. So I used oxygen, um, but I had more energy. Mm -hmm. So other people's sats were in the 70s, mine were in the 60s. People are looking at me like, you should look way worse. You should be dead. But I was, I felt fine. My energy levels were absolutely fine because I was processing oxygen differently. Yeah, it's interesting. But that is, um, oh, uh, I, I was talking to you off air about one of my favorite places in the world, which is the Biohack Lab. And they have a device called CVAC, which is this, you know, $200,000 device that basically gets gets you, it's, I call it the reverse hyperbaric oxygen machine, because it gets you into a simulated high altitude, mm -hmm. of negative pressure, and back up to normal pressure atmospheres, where obviously hyperbaric chamber is going to do the opposite, right? It's going to get you basically underwater, it's going to mm -hmm. increase the pressure. And it does that back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the results are, at least for me, the uh, cardiovascular resort results are, are incredible. So uh, it reminded me that when you when you uh, said that. And that's something I, I really look forward to every time I, I go there. Oh, yeah. No, it's fun. And you don't need a zillion dollar compartment. You mm -hmm. can actually hypoxic train um, as if you if you instead of going into like the biohacking world, you can go into the like hike big mountain type mm -hmm. strategies. And there's a, a variety of apparatuses you can use uh, to sort of make yourself hypoxic um, yeah. that are way cheaper and way easier to use. And I do exactly the same thing. Like you breathe yourself down to a certain point and then pop back up and breathe yourself down. And hypoxic training is significantly better for you than hyperoxic. Yeah. I am completely opposed to high oxygen therapies. I think that's one of the worst things you can do for your stem cells. I think it's very interesting. I think you are playing around with, you were playing, you're playing with fire because you're betting on perfect mitochondrial function, right? Like if you're, if you're getting yourself to consume a lot of oxygen, and I don't even mean to consume a lot of oxygen, if you're allowing your body to have a lot of oxygen, this oxygen can get can get oxidized, can get get basically get you in trouble unless your mitochondria is, is up for the task. And that's why we, why we see a lot of negative effects from people who are not 100% healthy and are going to hyperbaric therapy or, or things like that. On the other hand is if you really do need like a quick jump start to heal, that's a really good option. But we're talking about longevity, which a lot of the times longevity and I'm going to say just optimal acute performance can be, can be Very complete opposites. Completely different, you know? No, absolutely. Um, I mean, they designed hyperbarics to treat like diabetics with poor mm -hmm. vasculature that couldn't get oxygen to their tissues. Yeah. Uh, and in those instances, it's fantastic. Yeah. But in reality, if you are in a lab and you have a normal cell and you want to create a senescent cell, mm -hmm. basically you want to just completely disrupt it. You give it extra oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just destroying your stem cell niche by, by being in a hyperoxic thing. And I just, I'm always just amazed that people still do it. Um, yeah. you know, between that and the oxidative stress, it's just, it's, it's horrific. And, and I guess, you know, the study in, in Israel, if you sort of vacillate, you go up and down and up and down and up and down, you can theoretically, you know, assist your telomere length. However, there are many other ways to like sort of fix your telomere length. So I just don't think that that's the optimal thing to do. Yes. I think, well, you know, what we, We've obviously modeled a, a mask after that, or not after that, but hyper, our hyperbaric mask was really to try to mitigate the, these effects on our skin when people are undergoing hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And then we found out that the results, you know, even if you're not doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy, are incredible. And that's why it's called a hyperbaric mask. It doesn't put you under pressure. But what we found <laughs> really out is that... Heavy. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but what we found out is that it, the more energy you your body needs to, to produce, the more that energy costs you with something. So we tried to lower that, that energy cost. And then also when we get out of the chamber, that, that, you know, that basically whiplash effect, which is called the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox is um, really disturbing to a lot of um, longevity pathways. So things that we have activate active beforehand, like sirtuins, NRF2, um, um, AMPK really are kind of getting rattled and, and might not work very well afterwards. So we made sure that we have those activators there to activate them. And we did see incredible results in the chamber and, and out of it. But I think it's kind of a, a good analogy to explain why we cannot trust if we are not optimal, we cannot trust our systems to function, you know, optimally under stress, which it is stressful. What we're doing there is hormesis, you know, like any other hormetic process. There's too little and there's too much. No, I, I absolutely agree. Absolutely yeah. agree. So again, like I think we, we are covering, uh, I, I think a lot of things probably are, are uh, people needed to Google. So apologies to anyone who's, uh, who's forced to, to Google a little bit, but I think it, it's, it's a good uh, rabbit hole. It, like every sentence you're saying is a good rabbit hole for someone to go down. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm curious, like what's the future for, for, Sandy Kaufman, because you are so well versed in that field and uh, allowing yourself to really explore, again, canary in the coal mine style, really explore the outer edges of what we're understanding in longevity. So what are you interested in or what is your future within that uh, realm? So that's, it's, it, that's an excellent question. And I think the question is a two part question um, for me personally. I'm willing to try pretty much anything that seems to make logical sense. Mm -hmm. um, I spend a lot of time sort of examining the pros and cons of any therapy, um, any pill, any this, any that. What I'm going to end up be you know doing in the future, it's hard to say. Yeah. I am absolutely in love with exosomes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that everyone should be. I think over the age of forty, anyone or everyone should get an exosome infusion every month. I really do. Um, okay, well, let's go for a second. Probably about eighty percent of stem cell infusion function without the risk of stem cells. Mm -hmm. um, when you get to then stem cell biology, um, you know the, the argument is without stem cells, then your regular the, your regular cells are going to start lacking in mitochondria because you don't have an extra donor. Blah 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 blah. Um, yeah. But I, but I think that I'm going to start banking my own stem cells, which I have not done yet. But I'm going to do that. Um, I think when I'm 60 or 70, I'll go get someone else's stem cells, but I, 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 I don't know. Um, but for now I'm happy with my supplements and my light system. You know, I sit in front of a bio light, red infrared light, like all uh -huh. the time. I actually, it's really funny. I have a little portable light. I don't know if you do this and it's yeah. in my car. And so when That's I'm cool. driving, cause I, I drive, you know, to work every day and back and whatever, I'm always shining at some ridiculous part of my body. So at night, or in the morning before the sun comes up, my car glows this funny color. And I'm surprised <laughs> I haven't gotten stopped by the cops yet. Um, but, you know, that's sort of like these, these goofy things. So that's what I do to myself. Uh -huh. uh, in terms of my professional life, um, I'm going to phase out of anesthesia very soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to start a longevity company with some comrades here in Miami because I think that so many people need access to this sort of stuff. And I get emailed from around the globe on a daily basis that it's, it's time to sort of transition to doing longevity medicine for people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think if people only knew how preventable most, most things that they're feeling and, and are going to feel in the future are, and since they are getting evidence more and more from the environment, whether it's like famous people that are, that look way better than than their peers or uh, people around them that have tried anything from like trisepatide to, I don't know, to hormone replacement therapy therapy and suddenly really perform and, and have, you know, have their, um, really have their life kind of back um, to more advanced model. I think this is the, the beginning of a beautiful phase of our uh, society because we have people that have 
life experience, but an inability to access it as far as like expressing their full self. So I think that bridge is incredible. And, and it's a, a service as much as, I, I apologize, yeah, but it's a service as much as being an anesthesiologist is, right? So yeah, I, I more power to you. Let's say someone, obviously exosomes, we talked about it, but what is someone that is coming to your practice, you're going to be like um, focused specifically on? Is it going to be, you know, d- cleaning up diet, sleep, exercise, and supplements? Like what, what are you going to be focused on there? So I like to think of longevity as a pyramid. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there are things that you have to do every day. I think that there are things you have to do every month. And I think that there are things that sort of then fall into every six months and every year category. Mm-hmm. So in terms of things that people have to do every day, you're absolutely right. Diet and exercise are crucial. Yeah. Some people will do that and some people will not. I think that if you're paying money to come to a longevity specialist, you're sort of more inclined to listen and maybe like, you know, do things you're supposed to do. Um, clearly, you know, you have to take your daily supplements. You've got to biochemically affect your pathways, right? You need to activate your sirtuins. And by the way, I'm obsessed now with sirtuin three. I am like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely in love with dihydromorisidin. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's so cool. Um, but you know, you, you need your NAD, you need your sirtuins activated, you need to transglycosylate, you need your, you know, senescent cells to get rid of, you need to like babysit your stem cells. So obviously like the, the big supplement program is going to be huge, right? Um, in yeah. addition to that, People need a jumpstart to the supplements. And so we're going to, cre- I've sort of created an IV line that yeah. match the supplement programs. Incredible. So there'll be things that you can't get at Joe Schmo IV therapy clinic. These are going to be specially designed to target the seven tenants of aging. And then we can also specially design them for any one particular individual that's trying to you know, obtain a particular goal. Yeah. So that's going to be the sort of thing. And, and then of course, light therapies, that's going to be like a daily thing, right? Things that you do every month, exosome infusions, senolytic therapies are going to be huge, right? You've yeah. got to get rid of your senescent cells. Um, and not every senescent cell is the same. So, you know, you use the uh, decinitib, the quercetin, yeah. the fisetin. I'm a big believer in um, roxythromycin. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an erythromycin derivative that gets rid of a, a different subset of senescent cells. And we want to do that like once a month, just rotating them to make sure you get through all of your sets. Once right? a month, do you mean like um, uh, one course or one day? So, so every month I do two days of mm-hmm. high dose something. Yes. And I rotate okay. them. Right. All the studies demonstrate denacetab with quercetin. And the reason mm-hmm. they do that is that they attack slightly different cells. Right. But it doesn't mean that you have to do them together. Yeah. Right. So if you just do, you know, two days of denacetab, wait a month, two days of high dose quercetin, wait a month, two days of high dose uh, fisetin, wait a month, two days of high dose thrombi- uh, roxythromycin. And then you sort of like keep repeating it to, to try to get rid of as many um, senescent cells as possible. And mm-hmm. of course, the frequency is going to depend on how old people are, right? Um, I, I love Bill Andrews to death. He's the king of telomeres, but he always says that you can't get rid of all the senescent cells in old people because there would be nothing left. They would just uh-huh. crumble into a pile of dust. So depending on where people are in their longevity path and how healthy they are and how old they are, you sort of have to titrate all of these sort of things, right? Yeah. Um, so then on top of that, you throw in uh, the exosomes and the stem cell therapies. That, that'll, that'll be big. And we're working on, you know, all sorts of things. What are we going to bring in, be it V-cell activation or brain localization, cardiac localization, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to stay away from some of like the really intensive stuff for now. Um, not you really know, quite ready for plasmapheresis and that sort of thing yet. I'm not 100% sold on that. And clearly we're going to stay away from hyperbarics because I think that's just tragic. But what about the other things that are a little bit, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even call them extreme, but they're just a little bit, yeah, things like rapamycin um, or other rapalogs or what about some other medicinal strategies that, are, that have now shown to in, under some circumstances, benefit people such as, you know, uh, whether it is peptides like MOTC or um, GLP-1 agonists. So let me start, like, are, are you are you for rapamycin? Is it something that you're going to look at with certain people? 
So rapamycin is really interesting uh, because there are there's a, there's sort of this underground war brewing about the mTOR pathway, mm -hmm. right? And obviously, in animal models, they demonstrate that if you block your mTOR, you're going to do better in the long run. My yeah. absolute fear is that you're blocking tissues that turn over quickly, mm -hmm. and there are absolute yeah. rodent models that demonstrate that you're destroying your ability to make memories. Yeah. That's disconcerting. If you don't have hippocampal plasticity and hippocampal turnover, you're not, you're, you know, it's worthless to live forever if you don't remember it. Right? Yeah. Intestinal cells have to turn over very quickly. Uh, you also lose the ability to make muscle. So sarcopenia is a big deal. So I think that in terms of a blanket rapamycin thing, I, I, I just, I'm not, I don't think the world is quite ready for that. I think it needs to be mm -hmm. extremely tailored to particular human being doses we're not quite ready for and we don't have the ability yet to separate torch one from torch two yeah. i think probably in the next few years when we have wrap logs yeah it's going to be significantly better and targeted um to what we're actually trying to get versus just the carpet bombing effect of turning off mtor yeah but so where mtor is, is is a blanket statement and there is kind of one that we'll call it a good one and one a bad one and we're kind of shutting both both off where you know more advanced uh rapid logs will be able to shut shut only number two only only one of them off plus most if not all agents that are amp kinase activators are actually mTOR inhibitors mm -hmm. um, so for example you know metformin is, is the perfect example you know yeah too much metformin and you're shutting down mTOR and i will tell you that i felt that i took too much uh, um metformin several years ago and i could feel my memory declining so i backed off to 500 a day uh, added berberine 500 a day to it and and normalized within three months wow um, but there are all of the pathways are interconnected so you sort of have to understand that you as you sort of play with one you have to watch for the risks and benefits and how they all sort of even out so i'm actually a big believer in small doses of a lot of things versus large doses of a few things because yeah. i think that a lot of these things are absolutely synergistic um, and lower doses tend to have fewer side effects uh, absolutely and and you feel like metformin for you as someone that is extremely active doesn't impede your athletic performance slash uh, muscle mass etc so so metformin has a has a life so we talk in medicine, we talk about half-lives. Yeah, exactly. Right? How much time does it take for it to go away? It's about six to eight hours, mm -hmm. right? So you have to play with it. So during the week, I exercise at night, right? During the weekends, I exercise in the morning. So I separate my exercise from my um, metformin such that they don't interact. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And uh, you feel like berberine and dihydroberberine is, are not enough to... Uh, completely replace metformin as far as you're concerned? So I read through a zillion studies to sort of figure that out. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best studies that I found demonstrated that 500 milligrams of each separated by eight hours was the optimal dosing strategy. Mm -hmm. They're synergistic, right. and yet you're lowering the, the toxic effects of either. So the other thing that's really interesting, the molecules do not look the same at all. They're extremely mm -hmm. yeah. different. So the fact that they act very similarly is, is really quite interesting. Uh, and they also both change your mac, uh, mac, uh, microbiota in your guts. Yeah. So if you take too much of one, you're going to sort of have like more like a metformin gut. And if you take both of them, you get a more diverse uh, bacterial load. And that's what you want. As you get older, you become... Uh, less diverse and you want more diversity in your gut. So I think that that's sort of like the most beneficial way to do it at the moment. Absolutely. And obviously we know that this is, all, I mean, metformin or berberine are one of the things we're kind of circling back to, you know, these sugar molecules being, being able to reside in your body and attach to proteins, um, what we call AGEs or, which is funny, it's called, literally is age uh, but uh, or or uh, glycation. So we're also kind of serving the way our skin looks by minim minimizing those those agents. Um, anything, you know what? That's an interesting point. Like maybe we'll we'll finish with that. You did mention sarcopenia, and obviously you're again. It's a it's a problem coming to someone that is doesn't matter the age, 45, 50, and that notices that they have that they have uh, flabby skin on their arms or crepey skin and they want to treat it now. 
Whereas I'm asking you that question, but you were active all your life. You have the muscle mass to, to preserve. How do you address uh, that? Is it something that you do also with in machinery, like uh, I, uh, intense pulse lights and things like that? Or, or do you have strategies to address that, 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 are, that are only behavioral and supplemental? So I, I, that's a very good question, and it's extremely synergistic, and it's yeah. kind of, or multimodal. That's probably yeah. a better word for it, right? So number one, you want to increase your muscle mass. Yeah. So going to the gym, exercising the muscles, feeding your muscles the appropriate proteins, like leucine and the branched chain amino acids, right? They actually activate mTOR, but I think right time, right place. I think that's very, yeah. very useful, right? Plus, the more muscle mass you have, the healthier you tend to be, unless you're one of those like crazy like way more <laughs> and then it's yeah. the edge. but having um, having muscles very very important so if you bulk up what's under the skin that helps in terms of skin itself a lot of the things we've talked about helps your skin in terms of the crepiness you have to attack it from the inside and the outside so in terms mm-hmm. of the outside there are a lot of really good agents that actually depending on how old you are absorb into the skin and actually can start rebuilding your collagen and that's essentially what you need to get rid of some of the crepiness yeah in addition, um, I am a big believer in laser therapies. Yeah. Um, I'm actually the medical director of a laser clinic. Um, and I just stimulating the skin and the dermal formation and the collagen expression um, is just astounding what you can do. Yeah. Um, but what's, what's cool is you have you stimulate it, but then you have to feed your fibroblasts what they need to make the collagen. Absolutely. So, so, so my big running joke is that Jello shots are fantastic for you mm-hmm. because it has the collagen or the peptides in it to allow your fibroblasts to create better skin. Yeah, yeah, because they have gelatin, which is yeah, it's and, fibroblast and so, collagen. It's yeah, exactly. Um, and so, was really funny. And people always pay a zillion dollars for specialized collagen, and it's it's absolutely silly because by the time you take it, it goes through your digestive tract and it turns into dienpi tripeptides. So it doesn't matter what form you take, you get the same diatripeptides, which then actually go to your fibroblasts and activate the system to make your own endogenous collagen. Mm -hmm. The other, the other thing that works is hyaluronic acid. By the time you are old, you don't make enough hyaluronic acid. Therefore you look all skinny droopy because you're not holding on to moisture. Um, Uh And I love these women that carry around these giant you know, garbage bags or giant things of water. And you can drink as much water as you want. You're just going to pee it out unless you have hyaluronic acid in your body to serve as as a molecular sponge, because one molecule of hyaluronic acid, depending on how long it is, can actually suck up to like 6,000 molecules of water. So I'm a big believer in hyaluronic acid, um, which gets into your skin, your joints, your this or that. And it keeps you like physically hydrated and more youthful looking. Any thoughts within that category about creatine? To be perfectly honest, I'm not. I think creatine is extremely useful. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not on it at the moment because I use a lot of things that sort of overlap mm-hmm. what it does. Yeah. Um, but some people absolutely love it. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I think, um, yeah, again, like going to that to that low, lowest common denominator, it's so easy to get now cre- creatine. You can get it in gummies or yeah, any sure. shape or, or form. Um, and I think this is something that we obviously, I mean, that it, it can increase the amount of water, you know, held in muscle. So for, for that, that lowest hanging fruit, it's a good, uh, it's a good modality, but I agree. There are so many things that can overlap with creatine, which is, which is funny. Yeah. No, I was just, it's, it's funny. And, but the reason that I like hyaluronic acid as the, as the hydration sponge, mm-hmm. because Creatine gets into your muscle, Mm -hmm. but as you get older, you want it everywhere. For example, uh, people tend to rupture their, their, their discs. Yeah. You know, they blow a disc because their discs are unstable. They just, they don't, they're not hydrated. So they get very flat and then you get like the grinding of the bone and the rupture. And then you get like, you know, nerve compression and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So any place that has fluid in your body, hyaluronic acid will go and make it better fluid in your eyes um so all all the all the um the joints obviously skin skin is the obvious one that's what we all see um so we all like you know topically lather on hyaluronic acid but orally it goes everywhere as well so it's just an extremely important molecule so would you say would you say so for me some of the molecules that i'm taking immediately when i wake up 
uh, aside from so, so for some minerals, uh, NMN, and which is an NAD building block, NAD precursor, and hyaluronic acid. Uh, is it something that, and it does not upset my stomach, and that's why I, I take it on an empty stomach. Is that something that you recommend as well to take it on an empty stomach? Do you think it doesn't matter? So, so the only things that really matter is anything that is lipid soluble has to be taken mm-hmm. with food. Yeah. Hyaluronic acid is obviously water soluble, as mm-hmm. is NMN. So it doesn't matter if your stomach is empty or not. Yeah. It doesn't really actually have a matter. It it doesn't matter if something is in your stomach or not. What what actually matters is if your body uh, secretes the lipases to sort of get stuff that's fat soluble into your system. Yeah. So so rather than people having to sit there and come up with a fat soluble pile and a water soluble pile, which is kind of a pain in the ass. Mm-hmm. I tell people most of the time just to take it with food because that way it's all in and it doesn't really matter. But you're absolutely right. If, if it's water soluble, like those two things, you don't need to take it with food. Got it. Very cool. So if you could, we, you know, we covered some, some cool supplements. If I had to have you on a, on a deserted island with one, uh, one supplement, which one would it be? <sighs> oh, well, so it's a deserted island. Yeah, I mean, you have to live there. If you think of a deserted island, you you'll have to live there for a long time, right? Because until oh gosh, just just one. I mean, see, I hate this question because it's like asking for your favorite child, Uh right? That's that's just not a fair question. But I'm going to stick with my standard answer that has not yet been overthrown in several years, and I got to go with astaxanthin. Gotcha. Yeah, especially that island doesn't have a lot of shade, you know. So that's what I mean, right? And, And you can't grow astaxanthin on a desert island. Maybe this... to... No, I mean, like, it, I guess you could, like, eat a lot of fish and uh, get your ass. A lot of salmon. <laughs> right? But salmon grow, like, they're not really in the tropics. So I, I uh-huh. think that I'm going to have, the answer has to be astaxanthin. Got you. Listen, Sandy, uh, this was incredible. Obviously, you're a wealth of knowledge. Every subject we could have gone for an hour, but uh, I, I want to give our listeners their, their brain a little bit of a rest. So I super appreciate the time that you that you allowed us. What we're going to do is when you do open that longevity center that I'm sure is going to be incredible, we're going to give people some a peek in, into it and, and do a little tour there, which I'm excited for. Uh, but uh, until then, I, I super appreciate the time that you gave us today. Oh, my pleasure. I could talk about this all day long and you're one of uh-huh. my favorite people. So this works out really well. Great. Thank you again. And thank you, everyone. And have a great rest of your day. Okay. What an amazing conversation with uh, Dr. Sandy Kaufman. Really, her insights into cellular aging process and the potential to slow it down offer a whole new perspective on skin health and longevity. It's a perfect example of how the marriage of advanced science and skincare can bring about innovative solutions to age old problems. Normally, at this point, we read readers' questions, but I feel today, This episode was especially packed with knowledge, and I wouldn't want to burden uh, anyone's ear and brains more, so we're going to leave it at that. If you would like your questions answered on the podcast, you can ask your question in a review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or anywhere you consume your podcast, and we will be sure to answer it in our next episode or an episode that is specifically appropriate for that. So again... We would love to hear from you, so don't hesitate to leave a review or question on Apple Podcasts or YouTube or anywhere you're listening to this podcast. Thank you for joining us today on the Biohacking Beauty Podcast, where we continue to explore the frontiers of skin health and beauty innovations. Remember, understanding the science behind skin health is the key to unlocking your skin potential. Join us in the next episode as we continue to bring you in-depth conversations with industry innovators and thought leaders who are redefining beauty. Until then, take care everyone. everyone.